What's going on? We are almost to break. Today we're going to be talking about what's called psychometrics. Psychometrics. It's a little bit of a math day, so mentally prepare yourself for that, okay? We're going to be talking about how we study intelligence and how we measure intelligence. So psychometrics. Um, none of this is bold. You don't need to write this down, but that word means metrics to measure, right? And then psycho has to do with the mind, how we measure the mind. Usually this is in the form of some sort of test or assessment or inventory. So today we're talking about intelligence tests in a couple of units. We'll be talking about personality tests. And y'all took a couple of those on like the first you know, week of school. Y'all took the big five and the Myers-Briggs. That was a form of psychometrics, how we measure the mind. So with any good test, this is the first bold word. We have to make sure the test is standardized. We use this phrase a lot, standardized testing, but we don't have to think about what that means. To standardize means that everyone takes the same type of test. The questions have been tested and piloted on some group beforehand that represents the group that's being tested. And then we, we evaluate what's, what's normal, what the norms are, meaning there's an established grading scale. So we can sort of measure everybody fairly. That's the big idea. We want culture fair tests. It's not fair to give someone an intelligence test in English if English is not their first primary language, right? Um, it's not fair to give tests that are all about baseball to the baseball team, but then make everyone else take the same test even if they don't know a lot about baseball. That's not fair. We wanna make sure the tests are not biased. So. The SAT, the ACT, all these exams are supposed to be standardized and they're not supposed to be biased. They're supposed to be fair. If people from a particular group, whether maybe it's like if rich kids do really well on it or if white kids score really highly on it, that means our test probably isn't fair. There was an example from the Binet test in France. The question on the IQ test was, what does a cup go on? What does a cup go on? And the answer choices were like the floor, a table, and the correct answer was a saucer, okay? That is not a culture fair question. The rich kids, they all said, oh, a cup goes on a saucer. Whereas students from poorer backgrounds who took this test 75 years ago in France, they said, well, a cup goes on a table, a cup goes on the floor. They missed that question not a culture fair test. So with all psychometrics, we want to make sure they are fair, that there is no bias. This allows us to make sure these tests have what's called validity and reliability. You know these words from science class, validity. The test does what it's supposed to. An IQ test, it actually tells us how intelligent someone is. When I give you all the unit five test, if it's valid, it should actually show how much you know about unit five. Reliability, is the idea that the test works again and again and again. If you take an IQ test on Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, you should get about the same results. If you take the unit nine test multiple times, or um, if I have a couple versions of a test, for the test to be reliable, if you take the A version and the B version, you should do similarly, okay? If I tell half of y'all just do the odds and half of y'all just do the evens, if my test is reliable, that should be okay. You should score similarly if the test is reliable. So y'all do need know specific types of validity and reliability. So three types of validity. First, the content should be correct. It should be over the right stuff. Unit five test should cover unit five stuff, not unit six and seven material. Construct, the way that it is made, it should be readable. It should go in order. It should make sense. We need the technology to work. I once gave a test, and the printer had been running out of ink. So some kids got it where the, the words were super clear on the paper version of the test. And some kids got it where the words were super faded and gray. That test lacked construct validity. The test was not made well. And finally, to be truly valid, the test should predict something. Um, it should predict how you'll do on the AP exam, for example. It's really bad if y'all y'all pass all my tests and then fail the AP exam. It means my tests were not valid. And I'm a little concerned about that, the fact that your tests for me are open note this year. I'm worried, are my tests actually going to predict your AP performance? I just don't know at this moment, right? We'll find out. And isn't being valid, your tests need to be reliable. 
So if I split it in half, each half should be similar in difficulty. If I have you take it again, we call this test retest reliability. You should get about the same results. And if I grade it versus if someone else grades it, the score should be about the same. Enter rater. If different people grade, score, rate the assessment, they should score about the same, right? Some of y'all have problems with that with uh, some of your different teachers. You might be taking language arts with two different teachers, exact same class, 11th grade language arts. I mean, one teacher grades nice and one teacher is mean with the grading. That would be a reliability problem. So after you take these notes, go ahead and, and quiz yourself. I have six scenarios here. Which form of validity or reliability is this? Is this about the test doing what it's supposed to? And if so, explain which type of validity. Or is it more about the test being repeatable, replicable, reliability, and then which type of reliability? Pause this, try to go over these. We'll talk about them in class. Moving on. So once we have given a test and we have results, we need to know what the scores look like. How do we analyze the scores? How do we do um, not just descriptive statistics, but analytical statistics, take it a step further. So imagine that you have two classes here. They take a 10 question quiz. Here are the scores on first period out of 10, not very good. And here are the scores for second period. Could you draw a histogram to graph the frequency? I know this is math kind of stuff, but you should be able to draw a graph. It should look kind of like this. So on the x-axis, you have all the different possible scores someone could have gotten. And on the y-axis, you have how many people got that score. So what was the most common score? Well, four people got a six. That would be our mode, right? You remember the word mode. Um, one person got these scores. Now, if this was truly a histogram, so I kind of made a mistake when I made this graph because my PowerPoint skills aren't fantastic. Um, all of the bars should actually be touching in a histogram or a frequency graph because every person who took the quiz, they should be represented somewhere. There should be no gaps really in the perfect histogram. Let's look at that other class, okay? A little bit of a more different distribution. The most common score in this class was an eight. So that would be the mode we can tell because it has the tallest bar. And again, technically there shouldn't be gaps between these, I apologize. It should be a true histogram. So depending on how the data is spread out, we're going to have what's called a skew. Skew is when the average has been pulled in a particular direction. Skew shifts the mean. The mean is a synonym for the average. So think about where the tail is, meaning the long part of the graph, that's where the tail is going and that's where the mean or the average is being pulled. So sometimes we call this a negative skew or a left skewed graph. Whereas this, the folks over here who scored really high, for example, pulling the tail to the right, we call that a right skewed or a positively skewed graph, okay? And in any graph, the mode will always be whatever the tallest bar is. The median is always gonna be the middle bar. And then the mean is towards the tail, all right? It's on the other side of the median from the mode. So if you can find the mode, the tallest bar, you know the median is gonna be in the middle, the mean will be further towards the edge, all right? So here's an example. This is how much money people make, their household income, okay? And it says it's in thousands of dollars. So over here, we have the frequency. So the mode here would be this bar. Um, people making between $10,000 and $20,000, this bar would be the mode, the most common income. The median income would probably be somewhere around here, right? Somewhere in the middle of the graph which is the forty dollars to $50,000 range. And then that means that the mean would be towards the tail, right? So the average in this community might be something like $85,000. Well, why is the mean so much more? Well, it's because of this guy over here, right? The Bill Gates in the community who's making $2, million, $2 billion, they're gonna pull the average pull the mean in a positive direction. So the mean, the average will be greater than the median and the median will be greater than the mode, okay? That's how this graph works. Let's look at another one. This is the age at which Australian males have died. That's dark, okay? So the, the mode, I mean the most common age is this like 80 to 85 range. The median, 
or someone said, well, what's the middle age? Well, it might be somewhere here around 75, but the mean might be closer to 65 because we have a spike in the graph way over here. This tail, this infant mortality rate, these numbers of, of male Australians who died in their first year of life, they are pulling the average age of death down. This is a negatively skewed, a left skewed graph because the mean is getting pulled to the left, negative, okay? You should be able to answer these questions. And a graph like this out of A, B, and C, this is the number of CDs somebody owns. That's, that's old school. CDs, remember CDs? They're like records, but smaller, okay? So which of these would be the mean, the median, and the mode? You should be able to answer this. We'll look at it in class. And same thing here. This is like grades on a test. Which of these bars would represent the median? Which one would contain the mode? And which one would contain the mean? You should be able to figure out this. Um, we have here, um, this is a right skewed graph and a left skewed graph where the tail is. So make sure you can answer those questions. Roman numeral four out of five, we're cruising. This is where stuff gets real. Put a star by this. There are some graphs, some data sets where there is no skew. We call these normal curves, or sometimes they're called a bell curve or a bell distribution. In this type of data set, the mean, the median, and the mode are all the exact same really tall bar in the middle of the histogram. The mean, median, and mode are the same. Put a star by this point, okay? So for example, with height, this is fun. I don't know if you can see the x-axis, but um, a school took the kids and sorted them based on how tall they were and then had them actually spread out. This height, this curve, this distribution, this bar is a normal curve, a bell curve, a normal standard distribution where the, look at these are all men. So this is the average height for men. The mode, the most common height is gonna be 5'10". It will also be the median height, meaning the middle height. It will also be the average height, the mean. This would be a normal distribution. So um, an important word that I need to also star and write down is the idea of a standard deviation. Now, in this graph, a lot of folks were in the 510 range, but was everybody in the 510 range? No, people deviated. They were spread out, they were different. The standard deviation is a measurement of what we call variation. How varied, or the bold words here, how spread out the data is from the mean. On average, about how far away are people from the mean, median, and mode, right? So like for this graph I just showed you, I would say that 510 is the most common height, but most people were within about two inches between five, eight, and six feet tall. So for this data set, my standard deviation might be two inches. Most folks are 510, give or take two inches. That's what standard deviation is all about. In George Miller's magic memory number, right? He said that most people can remember seven, standard deviation was two, plus or minus two. Like, uh, like seven's the most common thing people can remember, but between five and nine covers most people. That's the standard deviation, how spread out the data is. And again, another star. That's right, I've had you star three things on the last two slides. When we talk about intelligence, this is so important, IQ, has an average of 100. We talked about this when we talked about Terman's IQ formula, right? Mental age over chronological age times 100. I said the mean, the average is 100, and this is new. IQ has a standard deviation of 15 points. So if you look over here at this beautiful graph on the right, I love this graph so much. What it's saying is that the mean, median, and mode are all at 100. That's the average and the most common score, but most folks score between an 85 and a 115. Most folks are represented by these green and blue bars. And if I gave an IQ test to students at Lanier High School, the majority would get a score between an 85 and a 115. 
I would expect the most common score to be a 100. And the next most common score to be like a 99 and a 101, 98, 102, 97, 103, so on and so forth. And 85 and 115 is the, we call that the one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below the mean. Most folks are within 15 points of the average. That's the big idea of a normal curve and standard deviation. So check yourself. Make sure you understand how SKUs work with questions number one and two. Make sure for number three that you understand how variation works. If you know how range works, then you also understand variation, right? Bigger standard deviation means that the data is more spread out. There'll probably be more of a gap between the highest scores and the lowest scores. Number four, interesting. Can you have a negative standard deviation? Remember, standard deviation is a number that tells us how far away on average something is from the mean. Could standard deviation ever be negative? The last Roman numeral is an important Roman numeral. And once again, I need you to put a star by this point, these three magic numbers, 68, 95, 99.7. 68, 95, 99.7. Say it with me. 68, 95, 99.7. You gotta remember these three magic numbers, get them tattooed. This is so important. 68, 95, 99.7. These numbers represent the percent of people falling within one standard deviation of the mean, within two standard deviations of the mean, and within three standard deviations of the mean in a normal curve. So again, in any normal curve, it could be intelligence, it could be height, it could be grades, it could be test scores, it could be batting average, free throw percentage. In any normal curve, which is most data sets, 68% of the subjects of the people fall within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% of folks are within two standard deviations of the mean and 99.7% of people are within three standard deviations of the mean, okay? It's just how close people are to the average. More people are near the average. And these numbers tell us exactly what percent of people are near the average. So this is kind of that same graph just blown up for you a little bit, right? So 68% of my data is between negative one and one standard deviation. 95% of the data between negative two and two standard deviations, and 99.7% of the data is between negative three and three standard deviations, meaning that only 0.3% of people are either scoring really high or really low. So if we cut this in half, right? Half of 0.3, half of 0.30, only 0.15% of people are scoring really low on a test, and only 0.15% of people are scoring incredibly high on a test with IQ. Let's put it all together. I love this chart, okay? The mean mean mode is 100. That's the average IQ score, right? Well, what are the, the, the tick marks, the intervals on my x-axis? I'm going up 15 points and down 15 points from 100. 100 is the average. And remember, this is the standard deviation. I said 15 points is on average for intelligence, 15 IQ points is on average how far away people are for the mean, from the mean. So 68% of folks score between an 85 and a 115. 68, 95, 95% of people are within a 70 and a 130. 68, 95, and then 99.7% of people are between a 55 and a 145. Three standard deviations below and three standard deviations above the mean. So uh, very few people score really high, really low. And we talked about what we call those people. We call them geniuses, right? Or, you know, below a 70, we said, if you also have problems with everyday living, you can be diagnosed with an intellectual disability. You're at the extremes. You're really far from the average for intelligence. So if we know roughly your IQ score or your score on a test or your height, we can then tell you what's called your percentile. 
the percent of people you are better than. Okay. So if you're at the 50th percentile, we would say that you are completely average. You're better than half the people. You're worse than half the people. If you're at the zeroth percentile, oh no, no one scored better than you. I'm sorry. Uh, no one scored worse than you if you're the zeroth percentile, right? Now, 99th percentile, that means you scored really high. You scored better than 99% of people. Can you ever score in the 100th percentile? You cannot because you can't score higher than you. We'll talk more about that in class. I don't want to confuse you now, but percentile, it's how good you did compared to everyone else. How many people you scored better than? All right, so another beautiful graph related to IQ, right? So 68% of folks are within 85 and 115. This graph takes a little step further. Janela tells us that half of 68, 34% of people are between 85 and 100. 34% of people are between a 100 and a 115. And it breaks it down to, we know that 95% of people are between two standard deviations below the average of 70 and two standard deviations above the average of 130. We know that 13.5% um, you know, of folks are in this range and 13.5% are in this range. And if we go all the way out to 55 and 145, we can kind of see where folks are. And the bottom here, the bottom number is the percentile. Someone who scores a 130 on an IQ test that is so impressive. It would be in the 98th percentile, meaning someone who scores here, they are represented by a bar at the 130 mark. This person is scoring better than 98% of people. Only 2% of people score better than a 130, roughly. Okay. Um, make sure that you can answer these questions. All right. These questions should be pretty easy, pretty straightforward. You may need to go back and look at the graph again. Right, especially with question two here, but all the answers to these questions are on the chart. Okay, so this is the kind of question that you might see on your test and on the AP exam. If you really want to go a step further, every once in a while they'll ask a more complicated question, maybe for a FRQ. Okay, so I have some question sets here that are based on a normal curve. And what I would encourage you to do is actually sketch out and draw the normal curve if you're willing to try and take your learning a little bit further. And imagine that you had a scenario where a thousand kids took a test, it had an average of a 75, standard deviation is 15. So what would the distribution look like on a normal curve? And then if you label it with 68, 95, 99.7, you should be able to answer these three questions. Exactly how many students of the 1,000 are within you know, two standard deviations below the mean to the mean? And how many students are expected to get at least a 60? And if you're in the 84th percentile, what's your test score? This is going to be some complicated. So some of this, folks, we can do it later. We can talk about it later. Don't stress about this stuff. But um, if, if you're feeling good about normal curves, and you're taking statistics, you should definitely be able to answer these questions. I have the answers for you. So try it on your own first, and then you can check yourself with the answers. Um, and then there's another question set here if you want to practice. This question set's maybe a little bit easier. Um, but still, if you want to go above and beyond with your normal curve math, try to answer these questions about tires based on those magic numbers, 68, 95, 99.7, and your knowledge of how means and standard deviations work, okay? The answers are here as well if you want to test yourself, all right? Fun. Congrats on making it this far. Um, our schedule, we are not going to have a Zoom on Friday. So congrats on making it this far. Zoomers, we're not going to have a Zoom. We have asynchronous work. What y'all will do in Friday's class, I'm gonna ask you to take a quiz on Socrative with the room code Jones LHS over this stuff, distributions and psychometrics. I'm gonna post three or four videos about savants. I'm gonna have y'all watch those videos on your own for part of Friday's class, okay? They're pretty interesting. Different types of genius uh, that we talked about from the last class period. You also will then have time to make up any quizzes that you need to make up, Email me if you're having trouble accessing something or if you have a zero for a test, let me know. Uh, work on your test corrections. You can do that for Friday's class. Those are due Sunday. So I can try and get them plugged in over Thanksgiving break. You just put them in the e-class Dropbox. When we come back from the break, there's, there's no homework video for y'all to watch for Friday's class. I'm actually just kind of letting y'all have a break. Okay, so, so get this stuff done before Sunday night, Sunday at 11.59 p.m., get the quiz and the videos and the, the test corrections done so you can actually just have a break from psychology. When you come back, 
We'll have a day where we'll kind of go over this stuff in class together, distributions and normal curves. We'll go over Friday's quiz over psychometrics. Um, there'll be one more homework. It's gonna be about language, how we develop language, what can go wrong with that little kid learning new words, et cetera. On the week we come back, we might have our free response on Wednesday, Thursday, but y'all will take your test on Friday, December 4th. That will give us about two weeks to kind of wrap up the semester, review everything we've gone over, and then, of course, your final exam will be at the end of the semester. So congrats on making it to the video. Zoomers, y'all don't have to log in on Friday. Rumors, if you're in class on Friday, we'll do some review, we'll take the quiz, and we'll watch the videos together, and y'all will still have some time to work on test corrections and things like that, but it'll be a pretty chill class, all right? Appreciate you all. If I don't see you, have a great break. Do this stuff by Sunday night. Peace out. Stay safe. Bye.